into 20% of the city. Long live free Libya, the call from the rebel stronghold of Benghazi, delirious residents in the city and in Misrata are proclaiming the end of the regime of the tyrant Gaddafi. Gaddafi's whereabouts remain unknown, although two of his sons have been arrested. They now face prosecution by the International Criminal Court. Today we have the very latest from Libya and from Tripoli itself. It appears the regime of Moma Gaddafi is ending. I'm Stuart Norville. Thanks for joining us on Live from Paris. Earlier, rebels told us they had driven, often virtually unchallenged, into Tripoli through a western neighbourhood. They said Gaddafi's fighting force melted away and images showed the rebels in the very heart of Tripoli. In Green Square itself, used until recently as the scene of mass pro-Gaddafi demonstrations, two of Gaddafi's sons, Mohammed and Saif al-Islam, have also been captured. The rebels now say they control the whole city, apart from up to 20%, which remains under the control of pro-Gaddafi forces. But is a fight back underway? We've heard and seen from our correspondents renewed fighting around Green Square. And also we're hearing of tanks apparently leaving Gaddafi's compound. There have been large explosions amid reports there of heavy fighting as well. Well, earlier I spoke to our correspondent Catherine Norris Trent and she was live on the top of a building overlooking Green Square where there's been a lot of shooting in the last few hours as pro Gaddafi gunmen appear to have been trying to start that fight back. I asked her for the latest. Uh, it seems some uh, pickup trucks uh, with containing Gaddafi loyalists sped through Green Square, which uh, has a been basically controlled by rebels for most of the night and, and shots were fired. There was an exchange of fire between the two sides. Uh, so that has dispersed quickly now, but it does illustrate how vulnerable, how volatile this situation is uh, and how unstable Tripoli is. Now, the rebels say they control the town, but it, it looks like there are still pockets of resistance from Gaddafi's forces. I mean, as you say, we've seen um, shots of people celebrating there, but obviously there are large numbers of pro-Gaddafi supporters as well in Tripoli. I mean, obviously they, they haven't completely disappeared. No, it, it seems they haven't. And that was one of the things that struck us as we came into Tripoli last night, travelling from the western town of Zawiya, 50 kilometres away, which had uh, been uh, liberated, as they say, by rebels. Now, driving into Tripoli, uh, it was, very, it was a, an epic journey, really, and huge fires burning on the route, but bombed out buildings, uh, really real devastation. And then coming into the capital itself, with lots of shutters down, it really seemed almost, almost eerily like a ghost town. There were groups of, uh, of rebel supporters out on the streets manning checkpoints uh, and shouting Allah al -Akbar, uh, Allah al -Akbar, the God is greatest uh, and things like uh, Muammar is the enemy of God um, but really for the majority of the citizens here in Tripoli stayed inside it, it seems uh, more shots being fired right now across Green Square it's, it is, still is a, a volatile situation and is it possible to tell how much of uh, the city there is under rebel control? I really think it probably is too early to make uh, judgments about that at this stage. The rebels say they largely control it, but, but one I spoke to last night told me that his home district of Tajara, which is in the east of Tripoli, uh, which has been one of the hotbeds of um, Libyan uprising over the course uh, of the last six months, uh, uh, one of the poorer neighbourhoods of Tripoli, he told me there was still fighting going on there into the night. Uh, in, the, uh, in the capital's uh, former Green Square, it's been renamed Martyr's Square now uh, by the rebels. Uh, well, basically, there were, there were big celebrations around midnight, hundreds of, uh, of people People gathered, mostly uh, rebel fighters, that quickly dispersed. Uh, uh, rebels, uh, they said, told people to go home because of security fears. So clearly the capital it, is not a consolidated rebel territory yet. Catherine, assuming you um, feel safe to continue, can I ask you, does it surprise you um, how quickly uh, Tripoli appears to have fallen, assuming it has done? It, it did, yes, and other people I've spoken to, uh, it surprised them too. I was speaking to people in, in Green Square when they were out celebrating. I, I spoke to woman, one woman who was uh, there with her husband, and she said she never believed this day would come, and certainly not this quickly. And I think, actually, that's taken a lot of people back. And that's one of the reasons behind this, this climate of, of fear and insecurity, uh, if you like, uh, that people really weren't prepared for this to happen. One woman told me she feared this was some kind of trap and that it, it was all a bit too easy and that she was perhaps expecting some kind of comeback from the Gaddafi regime.
And finally, Catherine, what about Gaddafi himself? I mean, there doesn't seem to be any news of where he is, although we are hearing that um, two of his sons have been arrested. Yes, that's right. Well, there's been all kinds of uh, rumours flying around about the Gaddafi family's uh, whereabouts and Gaddafi himself. As you can imagine, it, it is a time of great uncertainty and instability here. Um, so uh, lo lots of speculation about what's going on. Uh, as with many things to Tripoli at the moment, I would say most people really have no idea. Uh, the reports he's been fled the country, reports that he's even been killed, been arrested, uh, all kinds of rumours and speculation. Uh, it just adds to the sense of chaos at the moment. Catherine Norris Trent there uh, speaking to me a little earlier on from uh, on top of a building overlooking uh, Green Square there in uh, Tripoli. The team, uh, France Bank Action team there, have uh, now moved away from that area because they did feel it was unsafe. Catherine uh, also tweeting, in fact, in between speaking to us on France Bank Action. She's one of the few journalists uh, tweeting live from the area there. You can follow her on this address. It's twitter.com forward slash cntrentf24. Now, earlier, I also spoke to uh, one resident of Tripoli, Hannah Mohammed. She's just five kilometres away from Gaddafi's compound. She told me uh, what the latest was from there. I can hear the bombings. It's really heavy bombings and gunshots. We don't know in, from which side, in which area, because I'm in my house 13 kilos away from the uh, uh, square. So I have no idea, but I can hear the bombings. Uh, who do you feel is in control of where you are? Sorry? Who do you feel is in control of where you are? Is it the rebels or the, the pro-Gaddafi forces? No, uh, in my area it's the rebels. We didn't see uh, Gaddafi troops since uh, yesterday afternoon. And do people feel pleased that the rebels there are now in control? Yeah, sure. Uh, during the first hours from today, I was celebrating out in Tripoli streets. All the people, they were out, the families, moms, dads, kids, everyone was out celebrating. We thought that this is the factory, but I hope it will be a real factory. So you're now you're not so sure hearing the, uh, the, the fighting going on, presumably? Yeah, because my friends in other areas uh, in Tripoli, they can hear the bombings in their streets and the gunshots. They are in the center of Tripoli, near Babli Aziziyeh compound, where the Gaddafi used to stay. So is there any way that you can tell how much of the city is in uh, rebel hand and how much is in pro-Gaddafi hands? Uh, we have no clue. All the people, they say, uh, when I call anybody from my relatives or my friends, they say that they only hear the bombings, but nobody can go to the other areas to check if, uh, for, for which side. And pe people presumably are, are just trying to shelter in their homes, are they, and uh, try and keep safe as the, as the bombings continue? Exactly, and uh, in my neighbourhood, our men, they are out in the streets trying to protect the neighbourhood. So we are, like, uh, making small uh, groups to protect the area where we are. Anna Mohamed, they're a resident of Tripoli, talking to me uh, a little bit earlier. Well, International Affairs Editor Annette Young uh, with me now here on the set. Um, Annette, what happens now, assuming um, Gaddafi's captured? Do you think he'd be handed over immediately to the International Criminal Court? Well, certainly the Libyans wouldn't like that. And the feeling in the streets from what we're gathering from uh, listening to people and uh, reading their tweets is they really want justice to be done inside Libya. But most importantly, before that even kicks into place, is what will happen with those rebel forces. What they need to do now, Stuart, is secure the city. They need to locate any sporadic units uh, of Gaddafi supporters that might be creating problems. The last thing they want are snipers firing down on crowds of, who are celebrating and so on. So that is first and foremost. And uh, they'll be doing that with the help of uh, NATO and also American intelligence. They've been using Predator drones in the last uh, four or so weeks in order to give as much intelligence to the rebels as possible as to where those rebel, uh, sorry, those Gaddafi fighters might be located. The next thing is finding where all the weapons have been stockpiled because they need to do very quickly an infantry of what's there. Uh, there's a lot of hard, heavy sort of stuff, sort of anti-aircraft missiles, which certainly NATO and the Americans don't want to see fall into the wrong hands. And they want to sort of keep track of who's got what because if there's any further problems down the road, uh, you know, splits within the rebel movements, 
you want to know who's got access to what armaments. So uh, it, it's it's a difficult chore, and we're certainly nowhere close to uh, law and order being restored to the streets of Tripoli as yet. Sure. And just going back to, to the ICC angle, I mean, presumably it, it's also very difficult because Libya doesn't even recognise the ICC, does it, in the first place? No, it doesn't. But the way they got around that is through a Security Council uh, resolution. and There's been precedents for that before with Darfur. And uh, it appears that the ICC are obviously liaising with the National Transitional Council uh, we do know for a fact that they are talking to them in regards to the arrest overnight of Saif al-Izam. We've heard in the last few hours that uh, Gaddafi's other son has been arrested, uh, Mohammed. Uh, the next one, of course, apart from Gaddafi, is also his brother-in-law, al Sanusi, who was the head of military intelligence and was Gaddafi's right-hand man. Now, uh, what needs to be done, obviously, is to ensure that the ICC will uh, take over control of those uh, cases. They are very much asserting their jurisdiction over these particular uh, matters. Uh, they don't want to have a situation where they are being tried in Libya, bec primarily because of all the chaos. I mean, the NTC is going to have its hands full. They have to restore law and order. They have to restore governance to the country. And they're certainly not going to have the wherewithal to, uh, in the early part of those, that stage, to uh, conduct trials, despite what the public might want. All right, Annette, uh, of course, Annette's going to be with us uh, over the next few hours here on France Van Katte, giving us the very latest. And you can follow me on Twitter <laughs> as well if you want to keep up the discussion at Annette F24. Excellent. All right, Annette, thank you very much. Annette Young, International Affairs Editor. So who is Gaddafi? How long has he been in power? And apart from the war, of course, uh, what will he be remembered for? Well, in fact, he came to power in uh, 1969. His aim to create a regime underpinned by Islamic socialism. By the end of the 70s, a system of government by People's Committee had been born, although in reality the country remained a police state. Gaddafi also turned Libya into a haven for anti-Western radicals, where terrorist groups received weapons and financial support in the name of freedom. Tensions between Tripoli and the West reached a peak in 1988 when 270 people died in the bombing of a Pan Am plane over the Scottish town of Lockerbie. Two Libyans were accused of the attacks, but Gaddafi refused to hand them over, and it wasn't until 2003 that Tripoli took responsibility for the tragedy, which signalled a warming in relations between, Trip uh, between uh, Libya and its detractors. Since then, Gaddafi's had meetings with several Western heads of state, including, of course, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, in 2007. Gaddafi is certainly a character who has attracted plenty of attention in his time in power, not always for the right reasons. From this to this, it's been a long and eccentric journey for the Libyan leader and accused terrorist supporter. At the beginning of his reign in 1969, Gaddafi was a smiling, healthy political figure ready to lead the new Libyan Arab Republic. But over the years, signs of failing health and bizarre behaviour have prompted rumours about his state of mind and body. Television journalist Christian Malar recounted a live interview he had observed with the colonel. One day we had to book a live interview with him. He was on the other side, looking completely out of it. The Libyan ambassador at the time, who'd come to help during the interview, told us, I owe you an explanation. It's one of those days when he... And then we all understood. Descriptions of Gaddafi's strange habits from US cables were leaked to the world press. The Libyan leader was described in articles as a mercurial and eccentric figure who suffers from severe phobias and acts on whims. Gaddafi is known for his preference for female bodyguards, referred to as his Amazons and insists on pitching tents to stay in on overseas visits. He's also known for his vanity, dabbling in plastic surgery to keep up his youthful looks for voters. Gaddafi's Brazilian surgeon recalled the bizarre operation during which Gaddafi refused general anaesthetic for fear of being assassinated. He was conscious and he hadn't eaten. He'd fasted before the operation and was hungry. He asked me to stop. I removed the sterilized gowns and he ate a sandwich. Then we resumed the operation again. Gaddafi has appeared rarely during the recent revolution, prompting speculation about the state of his health. If you see him now, he looks all puffy, 
with swollen eyes. So his physical health is clearly suffering. But also his mental state, because he looks very vacant. Many people who have met him say he looks absent and not healthy at all. Whether or not Gaddafi's mental or physical health are on the downward slope, he's vowed to stay on and fight until the end. OK, we're going to take you um, straight away to Brussels. In fact, there's a, a NATO press conference uh, going on. Let's just uh, listen in to what they've got to say. As we have since March. And when we see any threatening moves towards the Libyan people, we will act in accordance with our United Nations mandate. Our goal throughout this conflict has been to protect the people of Libya. And that is what we are doing. Because the future of Libya belongs to the Libyan people. And it is for the international community to assist them with the United Nations and the contact group playing a leading role. NATO wants the Libyan people to be able to decide their future in freedom and in peace. Today, they can start building that future. OK, just to tell you exactly uh, what that was, that was the uh, NATO Secretary General. Uh, it wasn't live, actually. It was a pre-recorded statement, uh, just pre-recorded and uh, coming out of uh, NATO in Brussels. He said uh, our goal was to protect the people of Libya. He also said that NATO wants the Libyan people to decide on their own future. That's the latest uh, coming from NATO on the developments overnight. Well, the battle for uh, Libya has, of course, come at a significant cost for the rebels, with an estimated 15,000 rebels killed. Throughout yesterday, the wounded and the dead arrived back at a rebel makeshift hospital close to the front line in Zawiya. This report from France van Katra's Catherine Norris-Trent in Libya. Carried by his fellow insurgents, this young rebel has been wounded on the front line, shot by Gaddafi's forces on the outskirts of Zawiya. Three martyrs were killed by my side. They came from local families. We fired and then we returned fire. But we ran out of ammunition, so we retreated. And that's when I was hit. The young fighter has escaped more lightly than some of his comrades. He's been shot through the foot and it can be treated quickly. Doctors here just don't have the means to take care of patients with more serious injuries. We, we're facing a shortage of expert doctors. We uh, transport of casualties from the from scene of, uh, to here. We have the, uh, the many of them by the private cars. We, we, we not have many. We don't have um, um, many uh, ambulance cars. It's a makeshift hospital set up in an abandoned school in rebel-controlled Zawiya and doesn't even have mains electricity. But it is the closest clinic to the front line. This is the third casualty today. One of the dead will be taken to his parents' house and two others will be transferred to a bigger hospital with better equipment. These insurgents have just found out that a comrade, a friend, has been killed. A fresh reminder of how close the fighting lies. Rebels are keeping the precise location of their hospital a tightly guarded secret for fear of fresh attacks by Libyan government forces. So where is Muammar Gaddafi? Well, there have been uh, unconfirmed reports that two South African Air Force planes were spotted at Tripoli Airport, possibly to take him there, although a spokesman for the rebels has said that's unlikely as the airport is now under rebel control. Earlier, I spoke to our correspondent in Johannesburg, Nicholas Koch. I asked him how plausible it is that Gaddafi could end up in South Africa. It's certainly a possibility. I would say, personally, a remote possibility. But I think it is a possibility because of the strong connections between uh, South Africa's African National Congress, Nelson Mandela's movement, and the Libyan government of Muammar Gaddafi before the uh, defeat of the apartheid system. Libya was an important uh, supporter of the ANC, both uh, financially and to a degree militarily. 
uh, President Mandela, former President Mandela, when he did a, a tour uh, of uh, his allies, if you like, uh, after his release from prison in May 1990, he went to Tripoli to thank Colonel Gaddafi and to say that, in his view, they were comrades in arms. Now, that was 21 years ago. The world has moved on. But at least from an historical perspective, it is not impossible that the ANC would give uh, Colonel Gaddafi country here, perhaps for a short period. But I do think it's unlikely for various reasons. Nicholas Koch there in Johannesburg. Now, Libya is slipping from the grasp of a tyrant. The words of the US President Barack Obama in a written statement from where he's on holiday. He said Gaddafi needs to acknowledge the reality that he no longer controls Libya. He needs to relinquish power once and for all. He went on to say that this acknowledgement would be the surest way to end the bloodshed. Well, assuming it is all but over, it's been a conflict which has lasted six months. Only uh, a month ago, it still looked like it could drag on for many more. But suddenly, the tide appeared to turn. January, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi condemned civilian uprisings in neighbouring Egypt and Tunisia. But he wasn't to know the revolutionary sentiment would spread across to his own soil. Riots broke out in Benghazi on February the 15th after the arrest of a human rights activist. Momentum gathered in other major cities. <laughs> Protesters met the full force of Gaddafi's troops. The regime leader made it clear he would not back down. Why would I leave? Who would take my place? I don't have the authority to do that. I am not a president or a head of government. I am from the people. In March, France became the first country to recognise the rebel group, the National Transitional Council, as Libya's legitimate governing body. Later that month, NATO began its first airstrikes in Benghazi under a UN Security Council resolution to protect civilians. We are intervening in Libya on the advice of the United Nations Security Council. We are doing it to protect the civilian population from the mad and murderous regime which has killed its own people and has lost all legitimacy. That NATO has regularly been accused of killing civilians in its strikes. In late June, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Gaddafi under charges of committing crimes against humanity, but the regime leader clung to power. The murder in late July of Gaddafi's former Interior Minister, Abdel Fattah Yunus, who defected to the rebels in February, cast a shadow over the Transitional Council's unity. The rebels have progressed in Benghazi and Misrata, but they're still battling to take the petrol city of Briga and Zlitar near Tripoli. After 41 years in power, Gaddafi still has his territory firmly marked in the capital. But the costly and deadly effort to oust him continues. So who are the people who've been pursuing Gaddafi's forces for the past six months? And are they really the ragtag bunch of untrained civilians they've been made out to be? Let's have a look now at how the insurgents have turned the tide in the war against Gaddafi's army. They've been described as poorly trained and under-equipped ragtag fighters with little discipline or leadership. Yet they were united against one man, Muammar Gaddafi. In late February, insurgents wrestled control of Benghazi from pro-Gaddafi forces and slowly started capturing other key eastern cities. Advanced heavy weapons were in short supply and, above all, most rebel fighters were young with no combat experience. This man was a pizza maker before becoming a trainer. In Misrata, lawyers, doctors and students took up arms to defend against Gaddafi's attacks. I came here to join the fight because Gaddafi has attacked my family and there are other Libyan families here. Gaddafi forces tried to attack us with tanks. Forces loyal to the strongmen were far better equipped. The rebels sometimes had to fight back with primitive weapons, like this man here, using a simple mirror to find enemy troops. I don't see anything. There is no one there. But they must be there. They're firing at us from over there. Still, the insurgents made progress, slowly, road by road, house by house. Misrata was the only western city under rebel control, 
it became the stage for urban guerrilla warfare. Each attack was met with a counter-attack. The turning point was the start of NATO airstrikes. Every time Western forces bombarded the regime target, there was mass celebration, like here in Benghazi. At the same time, the opposition started preparing for post-Gaddafi Libya, setting up the National Transitional Council. About 30 countries, including France, recognized it as the legitimate Libyan representative. In the last few weeks, the rebel forces gained momentum as they closed in on Tripoli. Feeling certain victory was close at hand after six months of battle. One other story to bring you this half hour, and the uh, former IMF chief Dominique Strauss-Kahn could be freed this week. As